Hello friends, I'm Ashling, and today I'm talking April reading wrap up. So I finished nine books in April, surprisingly enough, because I didn't actually feel like I was reading all that much, but that's how it goes. Straight into it, the first book that I read was A Robin Hobb, and that book was The Ship of Magic. So this is the first book in the Live Ship Traders trilogy, which is a part of the much larger overarching Realm of the Elderling series by Robin Hobb. Firstly, I will say that yes, this is the first book in a trilogy, but I would say that it's probably best to read these books in the order that they were intended to be read. So you read the first year trilogy first, and then this is the second trilogy in the series. Now, in saying that, I didn't really encounter anything in here that I feel like I would have misunderstood or not had the context for had I not read the first year trilogy, but I don't know, friends. I'm just gonna say maybe read them in the intended order just in case. So all that aside, we are set in the land bordering the six duchies which we were traversing in the first year trilogy. This book is quite different. So the first book of the first year trilogy is much shorter than this. This one's a bit of a chunk. It's almost 900 pages. This is a story set mostly on the sea, if not by the sea. So it's a story about pirates, about sea serpents, slavery, heroes, cowards, and lastly, but of course not leastly, talking ships. So there is a precious commodity in this world called wizard wood, but wizard wood can only be obtained in a place called the Rain Wilds. Now, conversely, the only way that you can get to Rain Wilds is to have a live ship, which is a ship that's been made of wizard wood. But not just that, it's a ship upon which three subsequent generations have died on its decks. So, Grandad buys the ship knowing that he's not going to be the one that has the live ship. And so, wizard wood is incredibly expensive, but the other side of it is you actually can't get to the Rain Wilds without a live ship. So a ship that's made of this material that can only be obtained at the Rain Wild. So naturally, wizard wood is really expensive, really difficult to get, and live ships are quite rare. Everybody wants one because a live ship is a ship that basically does what it says on the tin. It is a ship that is essentially alive, will have conversations with you, will in a lot of ways sail itself, but it does have its downsides because it also comes with an attitude and a personality and a will of its own. So it's quite interesting. So this is again a multi point of view story. We follow mostly members of a family who have just obtained a live ship, so whose live ship has just quickened. We also follow a pirate who lusts after a live ship and will stop at nothing to get one. This is said to potentially be Robin Hobb's best trilogy. Now, so far, I don't know about that. What I will say is I know that I really enjoyed it, but it is a Robin Hobb novel, so it does take its sweet time. It's a very character-driven novel, as I've come to love and expect from Robin Hobb, but she doesn't move fast. So it is a fantasy story, but sometimes it often reads like historical fiction with some interesting magic elements thrown in. Trust me, if you're after a fast-paced book, Robin Hobb is not for you. That said, when you do reach the payoff of her novels, it's really something else. She holds on to things for a really long time and brings them all together in a beautiful way. I love Hobb's brand of fantasy and once again we're drawn into a world where the world building is impeccable, it's really compelling, the characters are believable, they're unique, they're um, frustrating at times, some of them are really lovable, some of them are really difficult and they're all very Robin Hobb-esque. That said, there are some chapters in here that are quite short, and in the beginning I found them really off-putting, really kind of disjointed, really strange. I didn't know what was going on, but as we got into the book a bit more, I started to come around to it, and I feel like these chapters are going to become incredibly substantial as the trilogy progresses. I still don't know a whole lot about the characters in these chapters. I think maybe if you've read these books, you'll know what I'm talking about. They're not from the perspective of a human. I'll just put it at that. This did take me a while to kind of get into. I had fallen in love with Fitz and Fitz's world in the Fire Series trilogy, and it felt kind of strange to be starting out completely without him, without any mention 
of him without anything to do with him and I missed him because I really love him as a character but there are some really great characters in here just none that I have quite fallen in love with in the way that I did with Fitz but we still have two novels to go in this trilogy so the jury's still out really enjoyed it really love Robin Hobb's writing next up then I finished a book by an Irish author named Cathy Sweeney and that book is aptly named breakdown. So my aunt Paula kindly messaged me to say that she had bought and finished this book and thought it was really good and thought that I might enjoy it so she gave it to me and I will say that I read it in one sitting. What that says about the book who knows but I'm just letting you know that much. So we follow a middle-class Dublin woman I believe to be in her early 50s and she wakes up one morning in her family home in the Dublin suburbs and without any real forethought she goes out the door on her way to work but she doesn't come back and she doesn't go to work. So her journey is kind of made up from a series of smaller decisions. So firstly she drives to her hometown which isn't too far away and she spends some time there and then that leads to a train ride to Rosslare Port and then a ferry to Wales. So this book reads very modern, very contemporary. There are some really sharp observations. I feel like it's a very feminist book. It's a novel about the largely kind of overridden rage of a middle-aged educated woman who has lived her life in accordance with the expectations of society. I wonder is this a book that sort of deals with a desire that most of us have had at some point to just kind of walk away from our lives or is that just me? So I feel like the decision to actually not name our character and just have her as an unnamed character kind of works really well because she could be any of us in a lot of ways. I did feel though although it did follow a certain trajectory I felt like it was a little bit disjointed and I don't know why but something about it didn't quite click with me. That said as I've mentioned I read this in one sitting so that says enough probably about the novel. I definitely think it's worth reading. I didn't absolutely love it but I found it quite interesting. It sort of scratched an itch in a way you know as I've just mentioned it's something that you know I think a lot of us feel like we'd love to do to just walk out of our lives and to just start a new quieter one. I feel like it is a very feminist book. It's a book about a woman just doing what she wants to do for a change. I don't have a whole lot to say about it. I know that some people really loved this book but I felt I was left just a little bit lukewarm by it. That said though I think it's something that a lot of you might actually really enjoy so we we'll leave it there. And the next book that I finished then is a literary fiction book in the form of modern classic written by James Baldwin and that book of course is If Beale Street Could Talk. So it's a short little novel and I will say whatever it lacks in pages and word count, it certainly makes up for in the punch that it packs. So this is my second James Baldwin book. I read The Beautiful Giovanni's Room last year so I had no doubt going into this that I was in safe hands and just as a caveat I did watch the Barry Jenkins 2018 film adaptation of this book but my brain being my brain I actually don't remember it very well but I do feel like it maybe didn't feel as gritty as the book itself feels. It does feel quite different and in my head the film looks quite different to what the book looks like in there. So as I've said I remember very little of the film but I did watch it in 2018 so you know that'll be the painkillers. So anyway the book itself we're set in New York in the 70s and we follow a 19 year old black girl named Tish. Tish lives with her parents and her elder sister and at the beginning of this book we find out that she is pregnant. Lovely but we actually learn early on that the father of her baby is in jail because he has been accused of rape. From the get-go we know that we're getting into a really intense and difficult story. It's a novel that's largely filled with flashbacks of Tish and Fanny's relationships. So they've known each other since they were young children. They've grown up together. So they know each other in a way that you can only know somebody that knew you as a child. So these flashbacks are kind of in interspersed with current day and there's a lot to do with the interactions of Fanny's family and Tish's family. That sort of mix up of people in there and how that goes. There are some really brilliant characters in here and there are some not so brilliant characters but that are written brilliantly. It's a novel that deals with race, with the large injustices of the justice system as it pertained then in the 70s and unfortunately as we still see today. It's a love story sure but it's also really charged and really powerful. It's really intense. You're by no means getting into an uplifting story so if that's what you're looking for skip this one. It is 
really short. It's only, I think this copy is about 170 pages, but it really packs a punch and this one is gonna sit with me, I think, for quite a long time. Also, I'm just gonna put it out there. This was a Penguin Modern Classic that I read that absolutely did not focus at all. I have never read a Penguin Modern Classic that I didn't like and now I'm getting a bit nervous because I'm afraid that I'm gonna break my streak on the next one that I pick up, but anyway. Oh, and just to say, if you have any suggestions about where I should go next in my James Baldwin reading career, please do let me know. I don't know where to go from here, but I definitely wanna go somewhere, so let me know in the comments below. And then next up, we have a rare non-fiction from me, and even rarer is for me to read a book that promises to change my life in some way, which is what this book is. So I do tend to veer quite far, like really far away from self-help books, each to their own, but they're usually not for me. But this one is one of those ones that's just absolutely notorious, has such really great reviews. I said, look, I'm curious, I'll give it a go. So I listened to it on audio and that book is Atomic Habits by James Clear and the subtitle is An Easy and Proven Way to Build Good Habits and break bad ones. So that's essentially what this book is about. So this book breaks down a set of systems that Clear has developed and suggests in order for you to do just that and I absolutely can't fault him in that sense. That is exactly what this book does. I think quite a few of the things in here are things that I had sort of already inherently been doing but just hadn't put a tag or a label onto. For example, things like habit stacking. So this is whereby you follow something that you already habitually do with another habit that you would like to instill in your life immediately after. So for example, you go for a swim and this is something that you do regularly anyway, but you want to develop a walking habit as well. So maybe what you do is you go for a swim and you walk back from the swimming pool, kind of something like that. There, of course, is a lot more to the book, absolutely, and some of the stories that Claire tells are actually really compelling in fairness, but this book contains one of those gripes that I have just with contemporary life in general. And that thing is just how often in this book that weight loss is mentioned as kind of something to be obtained and just one of these kind of be all and end all things that everybody should be aspiring to do. I don't know, to be honest with you, I am just so sick about people talking about weight loss as like the catalyst to you changing your life um, to everything becoming better, to just kickstarting your best life. Like, honestly, I cannot tell you how much I'm just so frustrated by it. So I did find parts of this book incredibly jarring. And if that's something that bothers you as well, I would steer clear. It is just used as an example and it does work in terms of the examples that he's trying to talk about, but it just, I don't know, I'm like go away. Uh, otherwise, I did find it really readable, really accessible, something that you can actually use and practice and potentially instill on your own life. And I hear that there are people that have used the practices in this book and have really achieved quite good, great things. It does seem quite actionable. I just don't know. I just don't know that I get what other people got from it. And that's fine. I just think that this brand of kind of self-helpy non-fiction is probably just not for me. And that's fair. And I wouldn't be me then if I didn't have a young adult fantasy of some sort thrown in. So the one for this month was a young adult dystopian book called Scythe. And this is the first book in the Ark of a Scythe trilogy by Neil Shusterman. I've heard really great things about this book and I was really excited to read this one. We're set somewhere in the not too distant dystopian future. In this world, all disease, all war, all crime, all death, so all ways to die, have somehow been eliminated. The novel doesn't actually go into how that was achieved, so if you're looking for some sort of framework for that, this is not the book that you're looking for. Eliminating death does come with a lot of downsides. We're already heavily overpopulated and what's gonna happen if nobody's dying anymore, right? So the only way to die in this world is to be gleaned by a professional side. This just means that you're killed by somebody that works as a professional killer, but there are a lot of rules surrounding how this is done, who does it, and the training that that involves, and all of that kind of thing. So it's not just like, oh, some people decide they're gonna kill people. It's it's not quite as simple as that. Basically where a professional side will come and professionally kill you following whatever framework and whatever has different ways of doing things, different ways of 
choosing who they're going to kill. In this particular book, we follow two teenage scythe apprentices, one named Citra and one named Rowan. And both of them have absolutely no interest in this vocation, but for personal reasons, they both decide to accept and pursue this career. So they both go on to learn the art of killing and how to understand like the necessity of what they do. They're both competing for this one same role. And as they get deeper into their journeys, they realize that they're both coming up against this really incredibly corrupt system. Would we expect any less? I found the characters to be a little flat here. I found the world building to be a little flat as well. Just my opinion. I didn't love it. I really had high hopes for this one and I realised that a lot of people do really love this trilogy um, but it just wasn't for me and I will not be continuing with the series nor will I be keeping this book on my bookshelves. I'll be popping it into a little free library somewhere near me. Next up then is some adult fantasy and this book is also part of a trilogy but it's the second book in a trilogy and that trilogy is the Green Bone Saga and the second book that I just read is Jade War written by Fonda Lee. So I read Jade City last year probably around this time actually and I really enjoyed it and anticipated that I would read this book very quickly and have had it in a lot of TBR lists and just not read it. So this month April just gone has been the month. So this is a series that's set in a fictional world and we are set on an island called Kikon. On this island exists a really rare mineral called jade. So jade can be mined on this island and it can also be wielded by certain people on this island. It can't be wielded by everybody. It will kill quite a lot of people, but most of the people that can wield this mineral are from Kikon. What jade does essentially is it sort of makes a person a better version of themselves. So it makes them faster, stronger, gives them better perception, gives them better senses, makes them better at fighting. And the more jade that they wield, the more these effects are exacerbated. But it can be dangerous also to wield too much jade. So the people that wield it need to be very careful. Kikon is ruled by two feuding factions. So one of them is called the Mountain Clan and one of them is called the No Peak Clan. So we mostly follow No Peak, who are made up of the Call family. So this is a multiple POV book. And in addition to the notorious and wealthy Calls, we also also follow the perspective of people kind of at the lower ends of the pecking order as well which is really quite an interesting way to do it. We see things from all angles basically. It's an incredibly tense and political series and it has some really incredible fight scenes and as somebody who is not really into reading fight scenes in books I really enjoyed them. They're very martial arts coded as well. So this is the second book in the trilogy so I can't really say too much about the story in this one. This moves outside of Kikon so we have a lot more kind of political leaning stories. We have a lot more world building again because these different countries are obviously a little bit different. There is a lot more characters introduced and there's just a lot more going on. The stakes seem to be heightened quite a bit in a political sense. I will say some of the time I did find my attention kind of going elsewhere when some of the kind of political stuff was being explained. That said, it doesn't go on for too long. It's not something really to be worried about. The world building is excellent. The character arcs are great. There is fantastic tension and the tone is dark and gritty and it really reads like a fantasy series that's just out there in a sphere of its own. I haven't actually personally read anything quite like this before now. Fonda Lee's writing is just really gripping and really compelling and she can really put a story together. There is a reason that these books are so well respected and so well revered and so well loved. If you're interested in a western coded fantasy with lots of martial arts then this trilogy is for you. The next book then that I finished was the second book in a fantasy duology. I'm actually not going to speak about it because it is part of the St. Martin's Press boycott which is probably fortunate because I didn't actually really enjoy the book anyway. So next up then is a book by Irish author Audrey McGee and that book is 
the colony. So this book has been on my shelves for a little while. It was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction in 2023, I think. But this is a difficult one to describe. So as I've mentioned, it's an Irish novel. And where do we go? It is, I suppose, at its most simple explanation, a book about a rural and isolated island off of the west coast of Ireland. So it's set in the 1970s, which was a really sad and turbulent time in Irish history. We're in the the early days of the Troubles, which was essentially a war between Protestants and Catholics in Ireland, whereby the Republic were trying to reclaim the land that had been colonised and claimed by the UK, and there was serious violence from both sides. So on this unnamed island, we primarily follow one family who are sort of living this really insular and isolated life far away from these horrors. They're unattached to the mainland and depend on boats that come irregularly to bring all of their sort of groceries and things that they can't grow or make themselves on the island. And this island is one of the few places left that has been untouched by the English language. So the people on this island actually communicate mostly in Irish. This particular family, they rent out a house for the summer to an English artist and he comes to paint the landscapes and he just essentially wants to be left in isolation. Then they rent another house to to a French man and this is his I think fifth year coming back to the island so he's writing about the Irish language and how it's being infiltrated by the English language as years go by so he's writing a dissertation on basically a comparative study and this is his final year to come back to the island. Naturally our Frenchman JP is quite upset that there is an Englishman here to taint the Irish language. There are quite a few generations living on this island of this same family so the youngest is a boy named James and he goes to an English speaking school on the mainland so he's bilingual. His mom speaks only Irish but does understand some English and her mother has no English and only communicates in Irish. JP, our Frenchman, believes that this language should be preserved in every possible way and just hates that this Englishman is here infiltrating and putting in the English words into the Irish vernacular. As we have an artist on the island, naturally this book is laced with imagery of landscapes, vignettes of history and debates about dying languages. It's really quite a gentle novel in a lot of ways as you might expect but what's done really well is it's interspersed with these really short chapters about real Irish history in which violent acts were committed on the mainland toward Protestants or Catholics by certain organisations. So there's a great juxtaposition between the gentleness of this island and then the violence that's going on on the mainland at the time. So in the beginning these chapters of violence are just kind of put in there and we move on but we do see then as the book goes on the family beginning to talk about and to discuss what's actually happening on the mainland. So it sort of mirrors I suppose English coming onto the island as well in a certain way because it wasn't there and all of a sudden it starts to trickle in a bit. The writing style of this one, it's not going to be for everybody. It's um, It kind of flip-flops in a way that your English teacher in school would have told you doesn't work, breaks all the rules, but sometimes rules are made to be broken, right? So we read from a number of different perspectives in this book and we can tell whose perspectives we, we are reading from sometimes because some people have like really short kind of sentences in their inner monologues and then there are people whose thoughts we read and there are no line breaks, no page breaks. It's just dense paragraphs. And another thing I will mention is there are no quotation marks in this uh, when people speak and I know that's something that really upsets a lot of people when they're reading. For me personally, it worked quite well. I didn't notice it, it didn't jar me in any way, but if, it, if you're somebody that just really hates that in a book, then definitely skip this one. The perspectives do change quite a bit in this and you would think in the way that it's done that it would be really confusing, but it's actually not. You just kind of get into it and get on with it and it works well. 
there are a lot of flashbacks in here there are a lot of inner perspectives so what's going on in people's minds and then the conversation tends to be a bit more stilted and doesn't give much away. I really personally enjoyed reading a book about the Irish language, one that was written in this way. It's just really lovely to see Irish words on a page. I don't know how well that will work for people who don't have a certain level of Irish because when I try to read Irish words kind of from an English speaking perspective and I look at them, they don't sound anything like they should. For example, the word inish which means now, is spelled A-N-O-I-S, so it looks kind of like a noise. I think for me, my brain just took it all and just moved on with it, but maybe for people who don't have Irish words, it might be a little bit jarring. That said, most of what's actually written in Irish, it is explained, it's only short sentences or words here and there, so you can kind of get the context. It's also kind of a really great literary tool and shows the lack of Irish in Ireland today in comparison with how much English is spoken in this particular book. It's a slow quiet and mostly quite peaceful novel and there are times when I did find it a little bit tedious but I think that this is a novel that will actually sit with me for quite some time to come. I suppose the subject matter is something that does and has affected me personally and is part of my history. I find it quite interesting in that sense and I wonder if people outside of Ireland or outside of countries that haven't been colonised in this way will relate to it well or will it go down well? I don't know but for me I think if you love quiet character studies that are steeped in history then this could well be one for you. The last book that I finished in April was a non-fiction and that was Cultish by Amanda Montell. Probably needs no introduction. It's one of those non-fictions that's been floating around that a lot of people are very much aware of. So this book deals with in particular the language of fanaticism. So it's a book that talks about how people and groups use language as an ultimate form of power. We deal with actual cults here but we also deal with things like soul cycles like CrossFit, like hot yoga and so on. It is interesting in that sense. So Montel argues that the key to manufacturing intense ideology and us them attitudes basically is something that all comes back to the language that they use to draw and to keep people in. There's lots of storytelling here interspersed with really well-researched facts. I will say this being a book about the language of fanaticism I thought there would be a lot more to do with the language and etymology and things like that and while it is about language I just thought there would be more of it. I'm not necessarily somebody who loves reading or hearing stories about cults. I'm sort of over it so possibly it's my bad for picking this book up in the first place. I did listen to it on audio and I'm glad that I did because I feel like if I was reading it physically I probably would have just put it down and not bothered picking it back up again. That said a lot of people really love this book, think it's like the best non-fiction ever so it could actually absolutely be a me problem. I just don't know that this is my brand of non-fiction and I just can't figure out what is. But yeah, that's that. We've reached the end of all of the books that I read in April and off we go then into the merry month of May already. Let me know if you've read any of these books yourself, what you thought of them, or actually also I'm looking for recommendations for maybe non-fiction in particular that you think I would enjoy. I can't even tell you what I enjoy because I do like reading about facts but I find that a story is what draws me on a lot of the time when I'm reading and if I'm reading a non-fiction I feel sometimes like I'm reading a textbook so if you have any suggestions please do let me know in the comments below. Also tell me what your favourite book that you read in April was. Otherwise thank you so so much as ever for watching. It's lovely to have you here. I hope you're taking care. I hope you're minding yourself and I'll talk to you next week in another video. Bye bye.